All right. So I'm Gabe, and I am a visual artist. Um, aside from being that, you can consider me somewhat of a, you know, a neo-primitive psychonaut of sorts. Um, I really like the strange, always have. Uh, in my art, I, um, I tend to make these things called installations, right? And here's one here. Um, these installations are all investigations into some type of peculiar or strange phenomenon concerning the human condition of sorts, or what it means to be alive, and w w what is going on here. You know, because let's be serious, this, this is pretty weird. So this here is a time machine, you know, because time travel, to me, is one of the most fascinating things. Uh, you know, we, we understand it through movies, you know, traveling either forward or backwards in time, whereas right now, we're time traveling. So this is one of the projects I made at a, a residency in Philadelphia, and it references a lot of those ideas that came from movies. You know, there's a, there's a hot tub water heater in there from Hot Tub Time Machine. There's a flux capacitor in there from Back to the Future. There's a booth you can get in, just like Bill and Ted, to go somewhere in your mind or in reality. And it's even powered by a great, mysterious zero-point energy force found in the battery right there on the right. But in my undergraduate studies, I didn't start here in this, this realm of installation. I started in printmaking. You know, I studied traditional forms of printmaking, you know, woodblock, relief cut, you know, some of the most primitive forms of the original types of printmaking there are. And what brought me there was that as a child growing up, as a teenager, you know, obsessed with the image of the world and the image of ourself, I was always fascinated by logos, you know, or symbols, you know, these tiny little images that could convey so much more than what you're actually looking at. So with this idea of appearance, and with this idea of trying to find out who I am, you know, in my teenage years, I found myself frequenting these things called transformative arts and music festivals. You know, you've probably seen them, you know, maybe, maybe leak into the news here and there. You know, Burning Man just happened a few weeks ago, and that's really the world's biggest transformative music and arts festival. It's really from the ground up. So for years, you know, over a decade, I traveled the country back and forth hunting these transformative arts festivals. And every time I was there, you know, mixing around with all these rascally people wearing bizarre things you don't find in the real world and behaving in ways outside of the real world, taking powerful pharmacological drugs to induce trance-like states is pretty archaic. And it really, it really speaks back to a history beyond our history of getting together in a community and doing something together and learning something about ourselves. So there's one thing I kept running into at these festivals, these, these symbols. And I was always like, man, what, I mean, you look at that symbol and all of a sudden you could feel something in your brain start to change. Your eye starts moving around, you start to see movement, you start to connect the dots. This, this term of what these symbols are called is called sacred geometry. And these are two of the most prevalent sacred geometry shapes or forms. Or are they even shapes? Are they even forms? Are these not just processes? Because we could look hard enough into both these, lay them right on top of each other, and see that they're both based on the same rules and regulations. So in my art, I created this pseudo-corporate force that sponsors all my work, right? Because, I mean, look around. It seems like the corporate force forces do control maybe a little bit too much than they do. And we could even understand ourselves as a corporate force in a way. But this symbol right here is like nothing new. It's based on the two symbols I just showed you. And it's, um, it's a 3D representation of what they call the seed or flower of life. So the seed and the flower of life is actually the same thing, but this is the egg of life. It's a 3D representation of it. And it's special 
because, I mean, it's six circles revolving around one, seven total. Seven is a powerful number. You're going to find it riddled in numerology and, you know, special meanings. All numbers are special. But this is a, you know, the egg and the flower and the seed of life are all universal signs of creation. Literally. It's a blueprint and a map of everything that exists. I mean, look right here. From a cellular level, in the embryonic stages of your creation, when you're conceived in the womb, you first take on these shapes. And right there, you'll find the egg of life. That's you. This is when you first became you. It's absolutely incredible to see at a molecular level, at a micro level, and then at the macro stage. From the birth of a star in nebulous forms to a swirling galaxy in perfect harmony and a perfect Fibonacci spiral spinning around in space. This is some fascinating stuff, right? I could, I'm already getting goosebumps. I'm getting fired up. So studying, you know, signs and symbols like this, you know, it's not, it's not long before, you know, you come, into, you come into the realm of magic. But before I get into this realm of magic, let's take with us the most important part of what I'm saying here. And that's that all of us are literally one in the same thing, right? It's all just a matter of perspective. So into magic, you know, my, uh, my intro or intro, you know, like when I first came across magic, was probably like the rest of you. It's when I was a child. You know, my dad had this card trick. He had this card trick that, you know, as a, as a young kid, it's pretty cool. You know, he would, he would shuffle the deck. You pick a card. He shuffles it some more, cuts it. You pick this. You put this there. You do this. You do that. Next thing you know, he takes the deck. He wedges it into your fist, and he smacks them all out, only to leave that first card you picked in your knuckles. Ooh, you know, kids love it. You know, but obviously all the adults can figure out, you know, card tricks are most likely sleight of hand. You know, it's an illusion. It's just a trick, you know. And then he had this other trick. And this other trick, really, as a child, like, bent me out of shape. <laughs> it, it, seriously, it, it was called The Wizard, you know, a fitting name. And The Wizard started off like the first trick, pick a card. And you would pick a card. But unlike the first time, instead of keeping it to yourself, you would show everybody. Once everybody knew what the card was, he would then pick up the phone, dial a number, and say, hello, is the wizard there? And if the wizard was there, he would ask, can I speak to him? And once the wizard was on the line, he would hand you the phone, and sure enough, 100% of the time, some voice told you what card you were holding. Now, whoa, right? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't sleight of hand. This is something else. And like, imagine a look on a child's face. Like, what? You know, like, you could imagine the things that ran through my mind. You know, everything from, there's video cameras in here. I'm being watched. They know what's happening. To, God really does exist, and my dad has his phone number. <laughs> you know? So I would lie awake at night for years upon years, thinking, like, torturing myself over the wizard. And, like, I know that I still have friends to this day, somewhere out there in the world, 30-some years old. They're scratching their head going, who's the wizard? But I assure you that the wizard is just a trick, too. It's just an illusion. There is no supernatural force behind it. it um, I can't share with you the prestige of that trick, but after years begging my father to do it, he told me. And unfortunately, this is not the type of crowd where this trick can be performed, because it does follow a set of rules and smoke and mirrors, you could say. But there's a differentiation here, right, between this type of magic, a trick, and what's considered to be real magic. So real magic is separate from that stage performative aspect where you're just entertaining a crowd by getting them to believe in magic, by the appearance of magic. Real magic is defined as the influence of a course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. You know, Wikipedia calls it the use of rituals, symbols, actions, and gestures, and language with the aim to utilize supernatural forces. Now, what's this term I'm using, supernatural forces? What is a supernatural force? 
You know, a supernatural force is an event, a force, or a being that lies outside of what we could explain in nature. You know, simply put, it's just anything that science can't explain yet because science doesn't have the tools to measure or observe its behaviors. Now, magic is old. It's really, really old. Right here, Toth, the Egyptian god of magic. Same god that supposedly invented writing, mathematics, science, all forms of language. Pretty intense stuff, right? So it's so old that you could see it not only in Egyptian culture with mummification, but elsewhere. I mean, look at the cave paintings. You know, some of the earliest forms of human art ever are representations of some form of magic. It's also important to keep in mind that a lot of them were very interested in the spirit realm, a realm you can't see with your eyes, a realm you can't touch with your hands, and specifically the quest to ascend life after death. Toth is pretty cool. So back to that misinterpretation, right? It's not just an illusion performed in front of crowds. But that interpretation is so common, in, in, at least in our culture, you know, that magic is just a trick. It's just a silly thing. So this um, popular English writer and wildly famed occultist named Aleister Crowley developed a rebranding of the term magic. He spelled it a little differently. This time he put a CK at the end of it just to differentiate the difference between, well, ah, that's magic over there, but this is magic. Now, what is his definition of magic? His definition of magic is the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Now, that's cool, right? Art and science together, you know? When you look at all those activities performed by culture, I mean, look at our cultures today. Look at every culture everywhere. And you're going to find some ritualistic behavior that can be perceived as some type of magic. Look at our culture. I'll tell you what's running rampant right now in America is yoga, right? Yoga is, is pretty cool. You know, it makes you healthy. You get to meditate. You get to spend some time in your own mind, collect your thoughts, find some peace and serenity, whatnot. But tell me that that isn't some type of art and science a behavior, a ritual that you partake in in order to achieve a certain effect through the practice. I would argue it is magic, which, I mean, look at India Vedas, you know, that's where it comes from. It is a form of magic. So let's keep in mind always that so many magic practices can be seen in these numerous cultures, and they always have a grand spiritual, religious, or medicinal implication of sorts to the culture that practices. We're going to sit on this slide for a moment and like really, really get that into your head. Because it's looking at that definition, it's arguable that, you know, magic's everywhere. It's all around you. Abracadabra, right? So abracadabra, you probably recognize that nice little term that the magician will say right before, you know, voila, here's magic. You know, it's, it's this declaration, an incantation of sorts. But this word's special. When you study the etymology of it, you know, the origin of it, the history of where this word comes from and why magicians use it right before magic. What, what is this word? especially looking at it in this form. It's kind of bizarre, right? Look what it's doing to your eye. You'll notice it's in this form, and it, it can be read backwards on the other side. It's just fascinating that it can form a perfect equilateral triangle. But back to the etymology. Where does it come from? There are some roots that date back to the second century, where the Roman sage and physician to the emperor used it as an incantation. And by incantation, I mean it was like a charm. Uh, it was like uh, a special enchantment to have this symbol around. So this, this guy, this sage, would prescribe it to anybody 
who had symptoms of malaria. He would tell them to make an amulet with this specific word in this specific form, wear it on your neck, and sure enough, you can rid off the disease and alleviate the symptoms of malaria. But that's not the only tale of the word. There's another tale that comes from, like it's stemming from other words, and it's just a branch of other words along a long history of words. And one of those words comes from the Greco-Roman period, and the word that it branches from is called abraxis, which is a pretty special word in, in that culture. It also holds ma like magic significance, numerological significance, it was popular in Gnostic traditions, and also links to ancient Hermeticism. If you don't know what those two things are, Gnosticism and Hermeticism, they're pretty cool and they have really, really powerful magical implications. One theory will even suggest that it derives from three, the combination of three Hebrew words for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If that synchronicity right there doesn't raise some eyebrows, you know, it's... It's, it's hard not to take notice. But my favorite origin of this word, and the one I want to focus on, is the legend claiming it to derive from an ancient Aramaic phrase. The phrase was pronounced avracadavra, which means, I will create as I speak. And phonetically speaking, looking at that phrase, avracadavra, abracadabra, you could easily see how they probably are the same word. But as an artist, that definition, I will create as I speak, holds great weight to me. It's, a super, it's, it's an amazingly powerful phrase. You know, like, let's look at the importance of each of the words used. Starting with the most difficult word, I. What, what a funny concept, right? I. The identification of yourself, your ego, right? Like, this is a troubling thing to think about. You know, it causes depression in some people. It causes narcissism in others. You know, there are Eastern philosophies, like Buddhism, that will go as far to say that that's what you need to eliminate in your life in order to be truly free. Is all the constructs that you believe make you, you. You must let go of. You know, and in those transformative arts festivals, you know, meditation, people inducing trance through, you know, rhythm, music, dance, drugs, whatnot, that's what they're attempting to do, is to shatter their ego, to destroy themselves in order to transcend beyond and above what we know of ourself. But as an artist, I could argue that, you know, sometimes it's crucial to have a strong sense of self. So you're not just wandering around lost in this world and succumb to the the actions of others. As an individual, to know who you are and what you plan to achieve is very important. So in relation to magic, Crowley states that one must find out for oneself and make sure beyond doubt who one is, what one is, why one is. Being thus conscious of the proper course to pursue, the next thing is to understand the conditions necessary to follow it out. After that, one must eliminate from oneself every element alien or hostile to the success and development of those parts of oneself which are specifically needed to control the aforesaid conditions. I know that was a little bit tough to, you know, to wrap your head around, but... It's just calling again forth the importance of, of a self-understanding. So back to abracadabra, right? Back to this idea of uh, create, you know? Because um, as an artist, I'm always fascinated in processes of creation, how we create, why we create, what we create. So let's ponder, you know, what we create. And what we create, at least as artists, is art. But what is art? You know, art is, uh, can be summed up in two simple words, creative expression. It's the application of creative human skill and imagination, typically, but not limited to, visual form. But art is also a classification of a particular skill, typically acquired through some type of practice. You know, like, like the art of dance, the art of conversation, the art of cooking, the art of making cheese, the art of speaking, public speaking, the art of war, the art of seduction. Arguably, 
there's an art to everything. So something troubling always happens to me when I run into somebody, you know, in, in short passing, you know, a new stranger, shake hands. I say I'm an artist. Usually, not always, but usually, I get this, uh, I get this reply that I'm not an artist. Whoa, I don't have a creative bone in my body. It's like, are you sure about that? You know? You might not be a good artist, but you're still an artist. I mean, try and find some type of human behavior that you do every day that isn't an art. It's very hard. I mean, look at your ego. Again, it seems to be a great work of art. For all we know, your life is the greatest work of art you're ever going to experience. And it's in your hands, right? Let's go back to this phrase. And let's uh, consider the, end, the, the word at the end there. What does it mean to speak? So Alan Moore, who you know, did V for Vendetta and The Watchmen, and he's a proclaimed occult magician, but he states that to spell is literally to cast a spell. To arrange words in a way that will alter the consciousness of another. I mean, look at this, all methods of communication, speaking, writing, sign language, body language, music, dance, theater, all these things are incredibly important forms of magic. All incredible like, ways to cast spells, you could say, to communicate with others, ideas that reside within you. But what's ironic is that like writing and speaking is among some of the easiest things we could do. Whereas telling a person what you're really thinking and telling a person what you really feel is among one of the hardest things to do. And that's one of the many fickle things in life, right? So as I move on, I want to stress a different aspect of this, and that's the association with the law of attraction. I don't know if any of you know what the law of attraction is, but it's this fun new, new philosophy that, you know, the power of your mind has the ability to bring about positive or negative experiences just by thinking about them, right? Creating your own reality, that whole idea of manifesting tomorrow in your mind. I mean, it is possible, and I don't know why it's not at the forefront of every scientific article, the placebo effect. It's real, the placebo effect is real, and if you don't know what that is, get into it. Get into it. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Our minds have the ability to affect our reality and the reality around us just by thinking of it. You think tomorrow's gonna be terrible? It probably will be, right? Our thoughts and our words and any external output we put out into the world literally affects it. One of my favorite scientific theories concerning this is what's called sound resonance. Now, sound resonance, you could do this fun little exper experiment at home. You, know, you take two apples, apple one and apple two. You take apple one, you put it in a bowl, you put it in your fridge. You take apple two, you put it in another bowl, and you put it in your fridge too. Every day, take out these apples. Apple one, love this apple. Like, show it so much affection and verbal love that it's creepy, you know? Tell, 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 it, tell it how sexy its new red coat is. Tell, tell it you can't wait to get that coat off and just get in there, right? Just, you know, like, this is kind of sick, but, like, love it. Tell, tell it how, much, how it's the greatest apple there, it's ever, there ever has been, and you just, it's just, you're almost ashamed to eat it because it's so good. And then look at apple two. And bully that apple. Like, emotionally harass that apple. Don't touch them. Don't, like, throw the apple. Like, you, you ain't nothing like this one. Like, you're a piece of trash. I should just throw you in the trash. Like, be mean to this apple. Tell it how ugly it is and how worthless it is and how it just, just can't even wait to get you out of my life. In three weeks, take these two apples out of the fridge, cut them both in half, and it's guaranteed that the apple that you were kind of mean to turns rotten from the inside out faster than the other. It's the truth. You could do this, right? But there's like the powerful moral to this story, right? And it's something we should tell the kids, right? It's wor you know, sticks and stones break bones, and words hurt. They do. Words can literally 
kill you from the inside out. It's like our words and our, our language and our, the way we treat things have great implications in our psyche. It's like our thoughts succumb to this thing called the snowball effect, right? Picture this. You're in a room. Somebody comes in. And like, say you're just, I don't know, you're in a thought somewhere. And somebody comes in and they go, hey. Hey, are you feeling all right? Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling all right. No big deal. But then two, three other people tell that to you. Hey, show concern. Hey, are you all right? Sooner or later, you're going to start questioning. Man, am I all right? Am I? I don't know. Maybe I don't feel good. I think my stomach might hurt. Next thing you know, you could mentally convince yourself to be ill. Now think about this and vice versa. You know, you're sitting there. You might be having a nice thought about this one nice day you were a kid at the beach or something, and somebody comes in and says, hey, you look beautiful. You're like, thanks. You know, you don't really think anything of it. Maybe you just got a new haircut or something. Maybe you're wearing new shoes. But two, three people tell you that in a day. Next thing you know, like you're hot stuff, right? You're like, yeah. You're like, I am beautiful. And like, it's the truth. Like, you are beautiful. Look at yourselves. Like, we're alive. We're breathing. We're here. It's a miracle. This is beautiful. No matter your appearance on the outside. I know this is kind of sappy and romantic, and you probably anticipate I'm going to trail off into some motivational pep talk about, like, get out there and be beautiful and save the world. You could do it. And you're right. Do, do those things, right? You can do it. It's cause and effect. It's really simple. You know, Gandhi said it. We but mirror the world. All tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our bodies. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a person changes their own nature, so does the attitude of the world towards that person. And now this is that whole quote you see, you know, circulating on the internet. Be the change you wish to see in the world, right? And it's true. It's real. Do it. Yesterday, I dreamed of eating burrito. Today, I'm going to eat a burrito. <laughs> Follow your dreams. It's, it's possible. Now, as we near the end of the talk, let's remember Crowley's definition of magic. The art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with will. What rituals do you partake in that in turn affect your life? What repetitive behaviors do you exhibit that show the rest of the world who you are and what you do? What kind of spells do you cast out? What kind of spells are you under? Be wary of spells that may be trickery. For instance, in that scenario where they ask you if you're feeling well, it, you just had the image you didn't look well. They asked you. Next thing you know, you convinced yourself. That's an illusion. You, you could feel whatever way you want to feel. But in the other, other scenario where you're beautiful, notice that that's the truth. We're beautiful. So keep an eye out for illusions. Keep an eye out for tricks. And in the words of John Lennon, always remember where I started today, that I am he as you are he, and you are me, and we are all together. I want to end this talk with this comic right here. Many of you recognize it, obviously. Maybe not some of the, the youngest ones in the back, but I encourage you to show them. You good? Yeah, I got the thumbs up. He's good. All right. So here they are. Two buddies walking in the woods. Wow, it really snowed last night. Isn't it wonderful? Everything familiar has disappeared. The world looks brand new. A new year, Calvin says. A fresh, new, fresh clean start. It's like having a big white sheet of paper to draw on. A day full of possibilities. It's a magical world, Hobbs old buddy. Let's go exploring. Now this picture will always like, hold great significance to me. Because here isn't a picture of a boy walking with his 
cartoon tiger frame. It's a boy alone with his imagination. He's out there exploring within his mind some type of hope for action, adventure, and discovery. So I encourage you all, you know, please, please spend some time with yourself. Figure out who you are deep inside, what you want, and please, for the sake of the world we live in, nurture the child inside of you. Cater to its imagination and share it with others. Project your visions for a better tomorrow out into the world around you. Stay magical, folks. Never stop exploring. I love you all, and I thank you for your attention today.